Thank you. That concludes general questions. We now move on to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Presiding Officer, today is World AIDS Day, so let me begin by saying that as First Minister, I am determined to play my part in ongoing efforts to challenge the stigma and myths associated with HIV. Uh, later today, I will have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Thank you. May I associate myself and my party with the statement made by the First Minister regarding World AIDS Day? Uh, and ask the First Minister, does she have complete confidence in our education agencies? First Minister. Well, as uh, Ruth Davidson is aware, we are undertaking uh, right now a governed, governance review. So our education agencies, I think, bring real strengths and benefits to Scottish education and to the curriculum for excellence. But we're asking right now some fundamental questions about school education and the best way to empower schools to improve. That's why we launched the governance review, which is looking at the roles, not just of the main agencies, but also of local government and indeed of the Scottish government. And it's part of a wider set of reforms that we believe are needed in light of the real and very legitimate concerns that emerged last year from the SSLN findings. We are absolutely determined to raise standards for all and close the attainment gap for our poorest pupils and the reforms we are undertaking to the roles and functions of the different parts of the school system will be a crucial part in achieving that. The First Minister says that fundamental questions need to be asked about those agencies and I think it's hard to disagree with that but she might want to reflect just for a second on who's actually been in charge for the last 10 years. Because over the last few days, this Parliament's Education Committee and education experts have begun to shine a light on that record. For example, it emerged yesterday that teachers are swamped with no fewer than 20,000 pages of guidance for Curriculum for Excellence. Parents groups have pointed out that these documents are, and I quote, totally inaccessible to the average mum or dad. And worst of all, expert evidence has revealed that parents and teachers have no way of knowing if Curriculum for Excellence is even working or not. As Professor Lindsay Patterson put it this week, this failure is a dereliction of duty. Someone has to be held responsible for this failure, First Minister. Who should it be? First Minister. Well, firstly, I don't, I don't accept the characterisation uh, as failure, but uh, for the avoidance of any doubt, I'm responsible uh, for taking forward this government's commitments when it comes to education with, of course, the Deputy First Minister, the Education Secretary. In terms of the guidance Ruth Davidson uh, refers to, that is guidance that has built up over many, many years. And one of the priorities the Deputy First Minister has been working on is simplifying the whole landscape around education and reducing the unnecessary bureaucracy uh, that teachers work with and I think uh, the efforts that he has been making have been broadly welcomed by the teaching profession. In terms of the wider uh, thrust of Ruth Davidson's questions, uh, I think uh, we were right uh, to put in place Curriculum for Excellence and I think Curriculum for Excellence and its development had, uh, broadly speaking, cross-party support. Uh, but what I am absolutely determined to ensure that as we go forward we are able to measure the success of our education system and we're also able to highlight uh, where things are not working as we would like. That's why uh, we have published the National Improvement Framework. That's why we will start to publish more data about school performance than has ever been published before. Uh, I think that is a sign of how seriously we take this issue and our determination to improve standards for all in Scottish education. Ruth Davison. We keep hearing from the SNP about jam tomorrow, but that's from a government that spent 10 years failing to sort out endemic failures in Scottish education. First Minister, the Scottish Qualifications Authority has the very important job of running our children's exams. And at the Education Committee last week, these were just some of the views that were expressed by MSPs. That the SQA exists in a parallel universe, that was Joanne Lamont. They were in danger of sinking in a sea of jargon. That was Richard Lockhead. Uh, the MSPs have seldom come across evidence that is so compelling in its concerns from Liz Smith and Tavish Scott, who ended up asking, please do not scare me anymore. A criticism <laughs> and a loss of confidence from right across the chamber. Now, I am sure, I am absolutely sure that SQA staff are attempting to do the very best that they can in pretty trying circumstances. But my question to the government is how have you allowed this to happen on your watch? First Minister. Well, firstly, Presiding Officer, can, can I say, and I'm, I'm sorry if this disappoints members, I don't think I am prepared to make not scaring Tavish Scott a key priority of Scottish <laughs> Government policy in education or any other uh, matter. But, you know, Ruth Davidson 
I, I think does a disservice to the work that is going on in education. Uh, the governance review is intended to take a critical look at the whole governance of Scottish education, not just agencies like Education Scotland and the SQA, but also the role of local government and indeed the role of the Scottish Government. And I would hope all MSPs, uh, those who expressed uh, the views quoted by Ruth Davidson and indeed every uh, member of this parliament and interested members of the public would take the opportunity, because there still is an opportunity, to give views to that review. Of course, it closes in the first week of January and the government will set out its intentions thereafter. And at the heart of this governance review is our commitment to ensure that as much power and responsibility in education lies with teachers in schools, because that's a key part in our view of driving the improvement we want to see. So I would have thought this is an opportunity for Ruth Davis and her party to feed into the governance review. I'm not sure whether they've done so yet, but if they haven't done so, I would encourage them to do so. Ruth Davison. I hear again the First Minister talking about all of the things that she plans to do in the future, but frankly, we've heard about reviews and commissions and listening exercises before, and the evidence before this Parliament points to a system that is broken. And let's spell out what the consequences are of 10 years of inaction from this government. We have a stubbornly wide attainment gap that's not closing. We have numeracy standards that are falling. We have inspections at a five-year low. And we have some teachers telling us that the exams that they're currently asking children to sit are the worst that they have ever seen. It is a generation of pupils that have been failed by the SNPs and teachers who are trying their best but are swamped by bureaucracy. So the First Minister talks of a governance review, but it's clear that the issues are far more fundamental than just the area that review tackles. And my question is, how many more pupils have to be failed before we get a root and branch review of everything and all of the changes that we actually need? Well, First Minister. Let me, let me touch on a few of the things that, not surprisingly, Ruth Davidson didn't mention. The fact that over the last few years we've got record exam passes in Scotland, a credit to teachers and our young people. Let's also mention the fact that we've got a record number of young people going into positive destinations in Scotland, a credit to our teachers and to our young people. Uh, let's also mention the fact that, yes, we've got an attainment gap that I've made very clear we are determined to close, uh, but we see signs of that already closing. So these are the positive things about education. It doesn't surprise me that Ruth Davidson wants to talk it down. But as I said in my original answer, we are determined to ask the hard fundamental questions about how we make Scottish education better. That's why John Swinney has already uh, taken steps to reduce the bureaucracy in our exam system, something that I would have thought Ruth Davidson would have welcomed. It's why we've established the governance review. It's why we're getting on and implementing the national improvement framework so that shortly we will have more information to hold the government and all parts of our education system to account about the performance of schools than we have ever had before. I think these are the steps parents around this country want to see us take because we are determined that we will have a world-class education system, that we will have rising standards for all and we will close that gap in attainment. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. The treatment time guarantee will ensure that eligible patients start treatment within 12 weeks of the treatment being agreed. That's what we were told by Nicola Sturgeon when she introduced the legal right to treatment for patients. So can the First Minister tell us how many NHS patients were not seen within 12 weeks since this legal right was introduced in 2012? First Minister. Well, since the legal right was introduced in 2012, uh, there have been uh, 53,257 uh, who have waited longer than 12 weeks, but there have been uh, 1,267,000 uh, treated within 12 weeks. Waiting times are lower uh, than they were when we took office, uh, but we have work to do because of rising demand in our health service, and we continue to ensure that our health service has the investment and record numbers of staff so that we can continue to provide the best care and treatment for patients across the country. That's a legal guarantee to 53,000 people broken. And in fact, over the last few months, have been the worst on record. And these aren't just statistics. It's pensioners in need of a knee replacement having to wait for months, or people waiting for eye surgery facing delay after delay. 
And each time I bring an individual case to this chamber, the First Minister promises to deal with it. It would take me centuries to work through each of these 53,000 cases. How bad do things have to get before she steps in to fix this mess? Well, First Minister. Kezia Dugdale talked about records when it came to uh, waiting times. It's worth pointing out that when this government took office, uh, there were only 85% of uh, patients treated within 18 weeks. Not only, not only have we reduced waiting times from 18 weeks to 12 weeks, a higher percentage of patients are now being seen within that shorter waiting time. Uh, so that's the progress that we are making. We also see record numbers of staff working in our health service and we see record levels of investment in our health service. And I know Kezia Dugdale doesn't like me to point out this fact, but there is going to be more investment in our health service under this government than there would have been in the admittedly unlikely event that Labour had won the election. Because Labour promised the lowest increase in health funding of any party represented in this chamber. That is the reality. So we have rising demand for our health service. That's why we continue to invest to build up the capacity of our health service so that we can continue to ensure that more and more patients get seen within these shorter waiting times. Kezia Dugdale. There she goes again, presiding officer, bringing up a 10-year-old record of a Labour government and pointing at England. It just doesn't cut it with patience. It doesn't cut it. She likes to remind the chamber. The First Minister likes to remind the chamber that she's going to spend £500 million more over the lifetime of this parliament. But what she didn't tell us is that Audit Scotland told us last month that she has to cut £500 million out of health budgets in this year alone through their health boards. That is a fact that she cannot avoid. In fact, it sums out the priorities of this government. Whilst Labour Party activists were out campaigning with NHS staff and patients at the weekend to protect the NHS, the SNP were out talking about independence. It's no surprise that the SNP don't want to campaign on the NHS, because here is their record. Local services facing closure, missed targets and a growing workforce crisis. Isn't it the case that under the SNP, the NHS is stuck in the waiting room whilst the First Minister plots a second referendum? First Minister. Well, the reason I... Kezia Dugdale rightly asked about the performance of this government. And when you're talking about the performance of this government, it is perfectly reasonable uh, to look at the situation we inherited and the progress that has been made since. Now, Kezia Dugdale wants to, wants to quote Audit Scotland. Here's what Audit Scotland said in its recent report. Overall staff levels are at the highest level ever in NHS Scotland. Now, when we took office, as I said, 85% uh, of patients in Scotland, this is quarter one, 2007, 85% of patients uh, in patients in day cases were being seen within 18 weeks uh, at that time. Now there are almost 90% of patients being seen within 12 weeks. So the waiting time is shorter and the percentage of patients being seen within it is larger. Now that is progress, uh, I think, in anybody's language, but it's not enough progress. That is why we are committed to continuing to increase investment, uh, not by £500 million over this parliament, but by £500 million more than inflation over this parliament. Labour simply committed to inflationary increases for the National Health Service. Service. So more investment, more members of staff, reforming our health service so that we get more uh, investment into social care as well. These are the actions patients across the country want to see and these are the actions we will continue to take. Just one constituency supplementary this week from Jackie Bailey. On Monday evening, over 200 people attended a public meeting to express their opposition to the proposed closure of the Vale of Leaven maternity unit. One of those attending said, and I quote, if the Cabinet Secretary for Health is not doing her job, then I am going to tell her and hold her to account. She has said she is committed to the Vale. The problem is that we've got to make sure she sticks to that. Those were the words of the SNP group leader on Western Bartonshire Council. Does the First Minister agree with him? And will she make sure that the Cabinet Secretary for Health sticks to the vision for the Vale? 
First Minister. Uh, this government is committed to the vision for the Vale, and it is worth pointing out, I think, because people perhaps have longer memories than Labour would like them to have. If Labour had won the election in 2007, it is highly unlikely that the Vale of Leaven Hospital would even be open today. That is the reality. This government stepped in. We saved the Vale of Leaven Hospital, just as we saved accident emergency services at Monklands and at Ayr. And we will continue to stand up for local services, uh, because that's what people expect of this government. And people know it's not what they got when that lot were last in government. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues have we discussed <laughs> at the next meeting of the Cabinet? First Minister. At matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Even though her Chancellor is in Scotland today to talk about Brexit with the First Minister, Ruth Davidson is obviously too embarrassed to raise it in here. In June, Ruth Davidson said her priority was the EU single market. But this week, her five tests on Brexit adopt the language of Nigel Farage about rekindling trade with the British Empire instead. It is clear they will sign up to anything on Brexit, no matter how bad the deal. It is a blank cheque Brexit. The Scottish Conservatives may have given up, but we have not. When the First Minister meets the Chancellor today, will she make the case for a UK-wide Brexit deal referendum so that the public can have a say on the final Brexit deal? First Minister. Well, firstly, I... It's nice, nice, I have to say, to hear Willie Rennie talk about the benefits of referendums for a change uh, in this chamber. Uh, but can I say, firstly, I agree with the broad thrust of Willie Rennie's question. Firstly, increasingly, it's very difficult to distinguish between the Conservatives and UKIP. And anybody in any doubt about that need only look this morning at what are reported to have been Theresa May's views on denying education uh, to children living here uh, from uh, certain other uh, countries in certain circumstances. But on the question of the single market, uh, I am absolutely consistent in this. I think the UK should stay in the single market. I don't believe there is any mandate or any justification, economic, social, cultural justification for taking the UK out of the single market. I will make that point to Philip Hammond this afternoon as I have made that point to the Prime Minister and to others in the UK Government and I hope everybody in this chamber will get behind that position of the Scottish Government. Willie Rennie. If I can gently say she didn't quite answer my question. Uh, momentum is building for this Brexit deal referendum. So I hope in time that she will come to support it. I, I am interested in what else she might have to say to the Chancellor. Look at what we are facing. NHS boards are contending with unprecedented budget cuts. Councils are facing a £500 million funding crisis. No doubt she will bitterly complain to the Chancellor about that, and so she should. But I want to know what else she is going to do herself. Because this week, she gained new income tax powers. I have a plan for a transformational investment of £500 million for education, with a modest penny on income tax. Will the First Minister join me, or will she just bitterly point the finger at the Conservatives? First Minister. Well. I didn't know Willie Rennie had... I don't know whether Willie Rennie intended to turn First Minister's questions uh, into a stand-up comedy routine, <laughs> but he's perhaps uh, succeeded uh, on that front more than he succeeds uh, normally. But there are serious issues... <laughs> there are serious issues underlying Willie Rennie's question, and uh, I shouldn't glide over the fact that I agree with much of the thrust of his questions to me today, which is not something I can say... Uh, every week. Obviously, this government will set out our own budget plans in a couple of weeks' time when the Finance Secretary will set out the budget to this Parliament. That is right and proper. We set out our income tax proposals in our manifesto, and I would remind Willie Rennie that we won the election on the strength of that manifesto. But Willie Rennie is right. Um, I will say very clearly 
to Philip Hammond this afternoon. And again, I hope Willie Rennie and uh, the Labour MSPs, and I'm pretty sure the Greens will back me on this, uh, that it is not acceptable that the Scottish Government's budget will be reduced by £2.9 billion, 9% in real terms, by the end of this decade compared to when the Conservatives took office. So I would hope that, with the exception of the Conservatives, everybody in this chamber would get behind me on that message. We were promised, were we not, in the EU referendum, that our Leave vote would deliver £350 million a week extra for the National Health Service. We heard from Philip Hammond last week, not one single extra penny for the NHS or for social care. It was absolutely disgraceful. All we heard were more cuts, uh, and extra borrowing, uh, and a bleak outlook for living standards and the economy. That's the price of of Tory government at Westminster. A number of supplementaries. First from Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Leaked Cabinet letters suggest the Home Office under Theresa May wanted children of illegal immigrants to go to the bottom of the list for school places. Is that a chilling insight into where an increasingly right-wing Tory government wants to drag the UK? Mm -hmm. First Minister. Um, unfortunately, I think it is. I mean, I take a, a very simple view of this. I, I know there are uh, debates around immigration, and you know some of uh, those debates are legitimate is issues that we've got to engage with. But the simple view I think all of us should take on this is: children are children. And when children are in this country, we should support them and we should ensure that they get an access to education. Uh, and I would hope that is something everybody would agree with uh, on basic grounds of morality and human rights. <laughs> Graham Simpson. Over the past six years, um, Scottish Government funding for councils has fallen by 8.4% in real terms. And that is a choice that uh, this Government has made. Can the First Minister assure us that that trend will be reversed uh, when the draft budget is published later this month? First Minister. Well, we will set out our budget uh, when the Finance Secretary stands up in the Chamber on the 15th of December and outline our plans then for local government and for other areas of our responsibility. But, you know, on the issue of uh, local government funding, uh, we do live in tough times and I recognise how tough it is and has been for local government. This government, uh, though, has treated local government fairly. Uh, the Accounts Commission... Uh, the Council Commission report published this week uh, showed that the decline in local government funding was broadly in line with the decline in the Scottish Government funding overall. Uh, but there was also some interesting uh, figures published uh, this week that the member, given that he's a Tory member, uh, might want to have a look at IFS uh, figures publishing council uh, level figures across the UK, which found that cuts uh, to local government funding, reductions in local government funding in Scotland and in Wales for that matter, uh, were smaller uh, over the period it looked, like, like it looked at than they had been in England. So perhaps uh, the member should have a word with his own colleagues before he stands up in this chamber and talks to this government about it when it's the cuts from his party to this government that's causing so many of the problems. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Ruth Davison said before the EU referendum that the Leave campaign was based on lies. After the EU referendum, she still said that she wanted to remain in the single market. She's since sold out completely, demanding that the Scottish Government signs up for whatever hard right Tory Brexit Theresa May decides upon. How will the First Minister ensure Scotland is protected from the dishonest interests of Ruth Davison's Tory party? First Minister. Well, I think Ruth Davison's shifting position on these matters shows that she's more interested in standing up for the Brexiteers and the Tory party than she is in standing up for Scotland's interests. It's only... It's only two years ago, remember, that Ruth Davidson said voting no would protect our place in Europe. Then she said a few months ago that she wanted Scotland and the UK to stay in the European Union. After the referendum, she said she wanted Scotland to stay in the single market. Now she's sold out on that as well. I think what we are learning uh, over this period is that Ruth David's position on these things, as it is no doubt the case on many other things, is exactly what our bosses in London tell her that our position should be. Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Franz Ferdinand, 
Stone Roses, Calvin Harris, Blur, Beyonce, are just some of the acts that have headlined Tea in the Park, Scotland's award-winning music festival. Sadly, will not be a feature of this summer's live music programme. Will the First Minister join with me and recognise the huge contribution that DF Concerts, headed by Jeff Ellis, has made to Scotland's vibrant live music scene, not to mention the Scottish economy? But will she consider what the Scottish Government can do to overcome the problems faced by the organisers, who say that there were many barriers leading to the cancellation of the event, and for that matter, any other organiser who wants to organise a live music festival? Scotland should maintain its track record and being a world-leading location for live music festivals. I hope she agrees. First Minister. Well, I, I, I welcome Polly McNeill's question. I, think, I, I know she wasn't in the last parliament, but she should maybe have a word with some of her oh, exactly. colleagues about the attitude they took when this government did try to assist Tea in the Park uh, to continue to be the success that it was. Um, can I pay tribute to the organisers of, of Tea in the Park? If it makes Polly McNeill uh, feel any better, I, I got some grief on Sunday from my 16-year-old nephew who went to Tea in the Park for the first time last year and was looking forward to going this year and is bitterly disappointed uh, that he is not going to be going. Uh, Tea in the Park, the organisers have set out why they've taken this decision. It is a break, not the termination of Tea in the Park. And I'm sure we all wish the festival every success in the future. It has been incredibly good uh, for Scottish culture and for the Scottish economy. And I hope we see it back before too much longer. Clear hockey. Does the First Minister share my concerns on comments this week from Defence Secretary Michael Fallon? that UK shipbuilding needs rebalancing, suggesting a risk to jobs in Scotland. What representations will the Scottish Government be making to the MOD to ensure they keep promises made to workers on the Clyde? First Minister. Well, we, we will continue to argue the case for Scottish shipbuilding. Uh, the Clyde Yards, uh, and I know this from my past constituency experience, uh, are the best place in the whole of the UK uh, to build ships. Uh, they have a, an expert and dedicated workforce as well as world-class facilities. Uh, we have seen the promises that were made to our shipyards uh, in the independence referendum, of course, watered down uh, since then. So I think uh, the member is absolutely right to say that we can't take for granted that the UK government will look after the interests of our shipyards. We're going to have to continue to make the case, and this government certainly will do that. And Alec Rowley. President officer, I think most people, most fair-minded people, will agree with the First Minister in condemning the austerity, the failed austerity of the Tory government. But given the devastating impact that that failed austerity is having on public services and communities up and down Scotland, will she not think again and look to use the powers of this parliament to protect the most vulnerable in our communities? First Minister. We, we will use the powers of this parliament to protect public services and the most vulnerable in our communities. That's why, for example, we will take a, a different position to the Tory government at Westminster over a tax cut for the 10% uh, highest earners in the country. We do not think that is the right uh, use of resources at this time. Uh, but we also have to, I think, be mindful of the squeeze on people's living standards. We saw a report last week that we're about to see the longest period of wage stagnation in this country since the Second World War. Uh, that's what Tory government is inflicting on people the length and breadth of this country. So we have to take a balanced view, protecting the vulnerable, as we have always done in our mitigation of welfare cuts, uh, making sure that we protect our public services, which we are doing, uh, for example, through our record investments in the National Health Service, but also making sure that we are taking action to protect the living standards of people across our country who are struggling to make ends meet. Question number four, John Mason. Uh, thank you. To ask the First Minister, in light of comments by the Secretary of State for Scotland, what commitments the Scottish Government has received from the UK Government regarding the devolution of further powers. First Minister. Uh, we've received no commitments at all from the UK Government regarding the devolution of further powers. Uh, we, of course, saw the comments made by the Secretary of State for Scotland at the weekend. Uh, as a result of that, the Finance Secretary has written to the Secretary of State asking him to explain exactly what powers he is referring to. We look forward to having a discussion on that. Uh, we await that answer, but uh, I do note that when asked about new powers for Scotland over agriculture and fishing, uh, the DEFRA Minister told the House of Commons that these would be part of a UK-wide framework. Well, that doesn't sound to me like new powers, and let me say that would be simply uh, unacceptable. We cannot allow Brexit to become a Westminster power grab, and this government will not stand back and let that happen. John Mason. 
yes, well, her answer uh, kind of confirms my concerns, I have to say. And we've had warm... <laughs> we've, we've had warm words... We've had warm words about further devolution from David Mundell before. Does she share my concern? She mentions agriculture and fisheries. Does she con share my concern that the UK government has used fishing in the past as a bargaining chip and might well use it again? Yeah. 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 First Minister. Well, I, I do think that is a reasonable concern because we know from official papers that previously UK governments considered fishing to be, and I quote, expendable. Yeah. They sacrificed the fishing industry in exchange for uh, wider interests. And I, I don't think that betrayal will be forgotten by those in the fishing industry or in the northeast of Scotland more generally. So that's why I would take no comfort from the prospect of a UK-wide framework on fishing. This parliament should have no doubts that this government will do everything to protect and secure Scotland's interests and the discussions that lie ahead. And that will include making sure that any powers coming back to Westminster uh, from Europe uh, don't stay in Westminster, that as far as possible they come to Scotland. That, I think, is what people would want to see us argue for. Adam Tompkins. Thank you. The First Minister mentioned agriculture a few moments ago, and given the fiasco of the SNP's mismanagement of cap payments in Scotland, there are many of us who worry about agriculture falling under the SNP's responsibility. But why, why would the First Minister prefer Scottish farming to be run by Brussels and not by this Parliament? Yeah. First Minister. Well, agriculture, of course, is within this government's responsibilities. And I think what I heard from Adam Tompkins there uh, was exactly what John Mason was expressing concern over. I think we're hearing the ground being prepared for that Westminster power grab that I spoke about. So if there are powers coming back from Brussels uh, to the UK, then in areas of devolved competence, they shouldn't stop at Westminster. They should come direct to this government. And I would hope nobody in this parliament would argue for anything different. Mike Rumbles. As we know, First Minister, agriculture is already fully devolved to the Scottish Government. Although common agricultural policy farm payments worth hundreds of millions of pounds will be paid to Scottish farmers through to 2020, once this ends, we should be free to design our own system of farm payments. Will the Scottish Government, as I've been asking them for a long time now, set up a specialist group now to design options that we want to see how our funding should be spent in Scotland post-2020. First Minister. Well, we will consider all options and we will talk to stakeholders in the agriculture industry and indeed in other industries affected by the Brexit vote. Uh, and we have given commitments to our farming community in terms of cap payments over the next few years. But, you know, there is a pretty fundamental question here that I think we have to settle First, and I really hope we have the support of Mike Rumbles and the Liberal Democrats because we don't even have a commitment that Scotland's share of that funding uh, will come to Scotland. So let's do these things in good order. And as we fight these battles, because I fear some of them will be quite tough battles, then I hope we will have the support of everybody across this chamber, including the Conservatives, because it will not, I'll repeat this, it will not be acceptable for powers to be taken away from this Parliament or funding that should lie with this Parliament to not be given to this Parliament. Uh, and everybody in this chamber should resist those possibilities. Question, Question number five, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the ability of the education agencies to deliver the curriculum for excellence. First Minister. Well, as I said earlier on, our education agencies bring strengths and benefits to education and also to the curriculum for excellence. Uh, but as I said in response to Ruth Davidson, we are asking some hard fundamental questions about school education and the best way to empower schools to improve. That's why we launched the Governance Review, which will look at the roles and responsibilities of these agencies and of local government and of the Scottish Government. That's the right way forward and it's a key part of our efforts to raise attainment for all and to close the attainment gap. Liz Smith. Uh, First Minister, at the Education Committee, uh, both last week and this week, uh, there was an admission from SQA and from Education Scotland that significant issues have arisen about subject choice in S4, S5 and S6, with many parents and teachers expressing a concern that there's been a narrowing of the subject choice because of the structure of the Curriculum for Excellence. Uh, and that's a comment that John Swinney acknowledged in a parliamentary answer that he gave on the 9th of June. So can I ask, what is the First Minister uh, doing to address this concern, given the very serious implications for college, university and job applications? 
First Minister. Well, these, of course, are uh, issues in terms of subject choice that are uh, largely determined at school level. But we want to make sure uh, that all young people get access to the qualifications that they want to and are able to take uh, to best equip them uh, for the, the further education, higher education and job opportunities that lie ahead. So, of course, we will uh, talk to and discuss any concerns around that with the SQA, with Education Scotland, with parents or any other part of the education system. And as John Swinney has been doing around bureaucracy in schools, around the governance of our schools, uh, around getting extra money into areas of greatest need to help us raise attainment, we will respond positively to all these issues. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, while the governance review sets out to empower local communities and schools, as you have outlined, First Minister, thereby creating a clear national framework, it also sets out proposals to strengthen the middle. What role is envisaged for local authorities in doing so? First Minister. Well, the OECD review that was uh, published round about this time last year, I think, uh, recommended that strengthening of the middle, that tier of education governance that lies between national government and schools. And that means, amongst other things, uh, considering the role of local authorities and agencies in leading and supporting improvement, exactly what we've been talking about today. Um, I agree with the OECD that increased collaboration and greater leadership in that middle tier is essential to support our ambition of raising standards and closing the attainment gap. And that's exactly why the Governance Review has included the question of how, for example, school clusters should operate and how councils can collaborate regionally to improve school performance and education. So these are all live issues being looked at under the Governance Review. And I will repeat uh, what I said earlier on. I would hope all members with an interest in this area of policy contribute to that review um, because the government looks forward to taking its uh, findings forward early in the new year. Ian Gray. <coughs> Thank you, presiding officer. The First Minister has repeatedly prayed in aid uh, today the Scottish Government Schools uh, Governance Review. But that governance review is about centralising control of schools and their budgets away from local authorities. Can she explain then how that will address the problem of the dysfunctionality of the SQA and of Education Scotland laid bare in committee this week. See, it's just, this, this is one of the really depressing things about these debates. You know, we have a, a consensus, I think, albeit we might uh, have disagreements about how to, to do things. We have a consensus that we need to see reform in our education system to tackle some of these problems and drive up standards. We've published a governance review to have an open, honest, fundamental look at our school governance. And at the heart of that review is a presumption. I think it's on the first page. I think it might even be in the Deputy First Minister's forward that that whole review is being taken forward on the basis of a presumption uh, that roles and responsibilities lie at individual school level. It's about the opposite of centralisation. It's about decentralising power down to individual schools. So I recognise this is a priority area, not just for the government, but for parties across this chamber. But let's have a grown up debate. Let's not just immediately uh, indulge in default opposition and sloganeering around this. Let's have a grown up debate about how to take our schools and our education system forward. Question number six, Anna Sauer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to address workforce issues in the NHS. First Minister. Well, we appreciate the achievements of all of our NHS Scotland staff in delivering safe, high quality health and care services day in and day out to the people of Scotland. Staffing has increased to historically high levels with over 11,000 additional staff since this Government took office, including over 2,000 qualified nurses and midwives and over 1,500 more consultants. We're also producing a National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan to discuss with staff how we ensure the right numbers and the right mix of skills across acute and community health services. And this builds on the creation of our nursing and midwifery workload and workforce planning tools, which have helped drive increases in the nursing establishment. And I saw Despite the warm words in the First Minister's answer, after 10 years of this government, the reality is, in fact, very different. Under this government and this health secretary, nine of 10 nurses say that their workload is getting worse. One in three nurses say there are not enough of them to do their jobs properly. There has been a failure to properly workforce plan with nursing vacancies up, midwifery vacancies up, GP vacancies up, consultant vacancies up, waiting times up, number of failed standards up, and private spend up too. When will the First Minister wake up, take responsibility and act for our NHS? First Minister. 
you know, Anna Sarwar may like to ignore or, or pretend that the fact doesn't exist, that since this government took office, there are 11,000 more people working in our NHS now than there were then. That includes more than 2,000 extra nurses. So there are record numbers of staff working in our health service. Yes, they are working hard and they work under pressure because of the rising demand for health services, largely due to the ageing population. That is why uh, we're not saying job done. We're continuing to invest more and more in our health service so we can employ more staff, yeah. but also reform services so that we build up social care, primary care, mental health services in the community to take the pressure off our acute services. Um, now, there is a lot of work still to be done around that. Uh, I would not say otherwise, but our health service is performing well. It's performing better in many key indicators than the health services in any other part of the UK. So let's get behind those working in our health service, get behind the investment plans of this government, get behind the reform plans of this government, because every time we bring forward a proposal for reform, Anar Sarwar and his colleagues oppose that proposal no for ideas. reform. So Labour, no Labour no have got no ideas. The lowest level of funding promise of all parties, Absolutely. completely Nothing bereft of any positive Nothing contribution to, to make to this debate. Nothing as long as that remains the case, we'll get on with doing the hard work for Scotland's patients. Question number seven, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update following her visit to Dublin. First Minister. Uh, the purpose of the visit to Dublin was to build on the already strong economic, cultural and political links that exist between Scotland and Ireland. Uh, following uh, a meeting with the Taoiseach uh, in Dakeni at the British Irish Council last week, I met in Dublin with the President of Ireland, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Foreign Affairs to discuss continued cooperation on a range of issues. I also engaged with over 120 Irish-based chief executives, business chief executives, at an event hosted by Ireland's National Business Confederation to stress that Scotland remains open for business and will continue to be an attractive place to invest. Uh, finally, I had the privilege of addressing the Shannad, the Upper House of the Irish Parliament, to stress again the close links between Scotland and Ireland that I hope we will see flourish in the years to come. Emma Harper. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Despite the howls of horror from Murdo Fraser and other Tories that Scotland would dare to engage directly with another country on matters of mutual interest, isn't it the case that closer Scottish-Irish cooperation could create significant opportunities for both nations? And isn't it clear that other EU countries increasingly want to engage with an international Scottish government as the UK's government's focus becomes more narrow and isolationist? First Minister. Well, yes. You know, most of the people I spoke to in Ireland at the start of the week uh, are horrified at the direction that the UK government is taking. Um, and we've got to remember that the Brexit vote didn't just disregard uh, the interests and the views of people in Scotland, it also completely disregarded the implications of Brexit for the Irish peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. And these are very real issues of real concern to the people of Ireland that they are now faced with having to work through in order uh, to deal with the, the negligence and the recklessness of a Tory government that wasn't interested in these issues during the referendum campaign. Um, and I think it is important that that whether it's in Ireland or any other part of the European Union, we do give a message on Scotland's behalf that Scotland is open and internationalist and outward looking, that we want to work with other independent countries for the common good, because right now the Westminster government is giving the complete opposite message to that, which is why it is more important than it has ever been that we take Scotland's message to Europe and to the world. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. For the avoidance of doubt, can the First Minister tell us if she had any formal discussions on Brexit with the Irish Government in Dublin this week? First Minister. 
can say that Brexit featured in pretty every discussion, pretty much every single discussion that I had, uh, government-wise, uh, politician-wise, economy-wise, in every other sense. The Irish government, like other European governments, is not formally negotiating with the UK or any part of the UK before the triggering of Article 50. That is a, a position that is well known, uh, or certainly should be well known. But it is important, and this it was recognised in Ireland, as it has been recognised uh, in other countries that we've been speaking to. It's important that Scotland's position is understood, that there is an awareness of the fact that in the UK we are not all uh, right-wing Brexiteers like the Conservative uh, government, that there are people who want to continue to build relationships uh, and to work cooperatively with other countries across Europe. So I will be proud to continue to send that message across Europe and I hope that even if we don't get support uh, from the Tories on that, we would get support from the Labour benches as we do so. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll now move on to members' business. I'd ask members, in the name of Ash Denham, I'd ask members to leave quietly as possible, and we'll take a few moments just to change seats.